So, part four is going to cover the last two stages of a five step model, which is basically step number four and step number five. So, when you look at the whole video now, we've covered step number one in your class, which is can you identify the contract with the customer? Step number two, which was basically can you separate the performance obligations which are within a contract? So, all those promises which have been given, can they be separated into distinct performance obligations which are separate? Then we jumped into step number three, where we said let's identify now the transaction price. So it's the price that we need to attach to this contract. And we look at factors such as variability of the transaction price, we look at significant financing component among other factors. Um, now we are in step number four. So in step number four, what we now want to do is, in step number two, if you came up with more than one performance obligation, Step number three gave you only one figure. But the purpose of separating in step number two was because we said we should account for these performance obligations separately. So that means it should be reflected under the revenue note on its own. Now, if that is the case, then that means each performance obligation identified in step two should have its own figure. It should have its own transaction price. But step number three only gave one lump sum transaction price. So what we now want to do at step number four is to take that lump sum figure on step number three, break it down, and allocate it to all the separate performance obligations which I, we identified in step number two. So that is the purpose of stage four, before we then go on and recognize it step number five. Okay. So let's talk about how do you do that. How do you actually break down and allocate? So the first thing that we need to take note of is we allocate the transaction price to the separate performance obligations based on sent along selling prices. So we need to identify if we are going to sell each of these performance obligations separately on its own without it being integrated or without it being sold as um, a combined uh, product, how much would we have sold individually? That becomes the standalone selling prices. So we need to identify the standalone selling prices of everything that we sell. So let's go back to the example that we gave in, uh, in video class number two, where we give an example of an entity of like Ethernet, which is selling a cell phone which has got a SIM card and it has got voice um, uh, airtime and it has got data vendors which are in it. Now, if they are selling this for $150, the $150 is the expected amount to be received by Arcanet, which means that is their revenue. But under step two, we then agree that we need to look at the promises we are that they have promised you the handset, they have promised you the SIM card, they have promised you voice airtime, they have promised you data for internet services. So each of these promises, is it separate? Is it decent? So should it be taken as a separate performance obligation? And under step two, we agree that these are separate. So they need to be identified separately. They need to be recognized in the financial statement separately under the revenue note. But for us to do that, the challenge is we've got $150. So how much of this $150 relates to the same credit? How much of this $150? relates to the handset, how much of the 150 relates to the internet, how much of this 150 relates to the voice um, airtime. So what we then do is, we go back, so for us to be able to allocate the 150, we need to allocate based on the stand along the land prices. So we go back and look at how much is the stand along selling price for the handset. How much is the, is the standalone selling price for the SIM card? How much is the standalone selling price for the internet data as well as for the voice data? For us to do that, we look at do we sell these products in house? How much of uh, how much would we charge when we sell them independently on their own? So we then look at if I was going to sell, um, if I was going to sell. Let's say I was going to sell the handset. Handsets are sold separately for $150. When you're selling um, 
they still can't you sell it for five dollars when you're selling the, the voice data let's say it's for uh, for, for five hours worth of talking uh, the voice then you sell it for 35 and if you're selling the internet data 500 megabytes will be sold for 20 dollars so those are the standalone seven prices so you then use those ones to allocate but now here's the dilemma when you look at the standalone if we're going to sell the handset for 100 and then the SIM card for $5, that's now 105. If we're going to sell the voice for 35, that's now 140. If we're going to sell the internet for $20, that's now 160. How do we allocate 160, uh, 150 based on 160? Because now what it means is, if I had sold these individually, I would have received 160. But because I combined them, I'm now, I'm now receiving 150. So it's like I am trying to incentivize customers to buy this product combined rather than to buy them individually. Because if you buy it combined, there is a lower price, which means there is an element of a discount which is there. So you need to watch out for discounts, which arise as a result of an entity combining these products and selling them as one. Now when that happens, the standard then says, you need to identify if this discount is specific to a certain problem. For example, let's say Aircon specifically says we want to promote our handsets which we're introducing. So for us to be able to promote this, we'll then say if you buy this handset, it comes with internet, it comes with data, it comes with a SIM card. So that will promote the handset which we want to introduce to the market. But in this case, it doesn't mean that we're giving a discount for the internet services, we're not giving a discount for the voice, we're not giving a discount for the SIM card, but we're giving a discount specifically to the handset which we're trying to promote. So in that case, you can take the whole $10 and you allocate it as a discount to the handset because it's clear, it's specific. So in this case, that means the revenue which we now recognize becomes, instead of recognizing a revenue of 100 for the handset, the revenue becomes $90. And for all the other products, the revenue remains the same. SIM card $5, the voice $35, as well as the internet megabytes $20. So in that case, we've allocated the transaction price specifically to the product we get related relates to. But sometimes what happens is they don't tell you which product they're trying to promote. So it's not clear as to this discount is relating exactly to what product. So in such a case, we would a discount but it's not specific to a product, then you need, you need to allocate now that discount and you spread it over to all the performance obligations which are within the contract. Which means that $10 should be spread over. A portion goes to the handset, a portion goes to the SIM card, a portion goes to the voice, a portion goes to the internet data. And how do you do that? So what it means is we need to allocate the 150 based on the standalone selling prices. So what we do is, since the total selling standalone selling prices is 160, the revenue which relates to the, um, to the handset becomes 100 over 160 multiplied by 150, which is the transaction price. The revenue which relates to the SIM card becomes $5 over 160 multiplied by 150, the transaction price. The, the amount which relates, the revenue which relates to the voice becomes 35 over 160 multiplied by 150. And then to the internet, it also becomes 20 over 160 multiplied by 150. I hope that one is clear. So in that case, you've allocated now the transaction price of 150 to all the separate performance obligations based on the standard selling price. But this itself was a bit simpler because we have assumed that these products have been sold internally. So that means we do know the transaction price for the standalone selling price or the standalone selling prices. Now here's where the dilemma comes. What if I'm not selling the product in house? Which means I cannot know how much can this product be sold for. So I can't know the standalone selling price. So in such a case, the standard then says, when you do not sell the product in-house, then that means you need to estimate the sent-along selling prices. 
So you are no longer just going in taking from your 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 your, your practice, but you're actually now estimating how much could be the standalone selling price for this because we do not sell it in house. And this usually happens when you have got some products which you give for free, but you actually do not sell them. It usually happens when you look at internet companies. So when you go to internet service provider, what they do is that they say they're selling you um, they're selling you internet services, but they give you a free router in terms of uh, the, when they come in and, and the sort of thing. So the router is for free, and the installation of that route and everything is also for free. But you only pay for is the internet services. So what it means is they actually do not sell installation services. They actually do not sell routers. But the router is a separate type of obligation because I can enjoy it separately on my own, and the entity can actually also uh, it doesn't significantly change the the internet provision. So in that case, it means. The promises which the, act, the customer has is installation, the router, and the internet service. So, are they distant? If the router is distant, what it also means is we need to identify the separate performance obligation of the router and its own. But since the company does not sell routers, how are they going to know the standard of selling price for that? So, what they will need to do is they will need to estimate. Now, the standard says when you're going to estimate the standard of selling price, you actually have got three methods which you can actually choose to use. And the first method is you can use the cost plus margin um, method, which is basically you can take the cost, you put a markup, and then you get to the, to the standalone selling price. So each will have its own cost, because if I'm going to be giving you free routers, that router I have to buy it, so there's a cost of me buying that. Then what I need to know now is, if I'm going to give you for you, what would be the standard one selling price? So I'll take the cost and I'll put a markup. That becomes the standard one selling price. Okay. And you see that when you do the January 2018 ITC paper 3, it has got a very good question on that. Then, um, let's, that, that was the method, method number one. Another method we can actually use is, we can also use the um, market price of similar goods or services. So I might not be selling routers, but I know that there is another company which actually sells routers. So in that case, that means I can actually estimate based on how much is it being sold for by that other company. That becomes my standard on certain price because I'm on a benchmark which I can actually use. So that's the second way of estimating a standard on certain price. The third method of estimating your standard, your standard on certain price is the residual approach. Now, the residual approach simply means that we've got a transaction price which we have, and we've got a number of performance obligations which we have, and we've got standalone selling prices for most of them, but you don't have for one. So, for that one which you don't have, you can actually remove the standalone for the others from the transaction price, and the remaining becomes your transaction price, standalone selling price for the remainder. Now, to put this into perspective, into context, let me jump back. To the example which was, which was giving about the 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 Ethernet example. So for the Ethernet example, we agree that the transaction price is one hundred and fifty dollars. Of that one hundred and fifty dollars, we also said we've got the standard one selling prices, which are for the the the, the voice, which is thirty five, for the internet, which is twenty, for the SIM card, which was five dollars. But because we've got this new thing that we're giving for free. Uh, which is uh, the let's say we're giving we're giving for free the the handset. What is the value of the handset in this case? So we can actually use the residual, which means if we take one fifty, you remove the SIM card five dollars, you remove thirty five dollars for the voice, you remove um, for the internet the twenty dollars. So five and thirty five forty and twenty sixty. So that means out of the one fifty we remove sixty. The remainder, which is the ninety, is the one which relates to the handset. So we then allocate the remainder as the residual benefit and becomes our standard and standard price for the handset. Okay. So those are the methods that you can actually use when you're coming up or you're determining your standard and standard prices. Right. So let's jump to an example just to put this into perspective. Let's look at a company which is called KV Company. And KV Company sells um, vehicles with a three-year service plan, which is for 100000 
and the standard log selling price for the vehicle and the service plan is 100k each and 25k respectively. Now, given this, you want to account for this, you want to allocate that transaction price. So number one, for me to allocate, I need to know what are the promises. I can see from, the, from here that the promises are we're going to give you a car. And for that car, we're going to give you a three-year service plan. That's another promise. Then the question is, based on step two, are these promises distant? So are these separate performance obligations? Now look at benefit analysis. Can the customer benefit of the car without the, main, the, the, the service plan? Yes, I can drive my car and I can actually service it on my own if I am um, if I am a mechanic. I can hire a mechanic and get service my car. So I can actually enjoy the car but other readily available resources which are mechanics, which is not here. Can I enjoy the maintenance service? Can I just buy another car not from here and I can for service at your, at your place? Yes, I can do that. So that means you can actually enjoy these, all of these, separately. When you look at the context of the, of the contract, um, are these inputs to each other? No, I don't think so. So the service, the maintenance service, does not significantly change the car. The car still remains what it is like. So it doesn't modify the car. There's no significant integration of services here. Uh, so that means when I look at this within the context of the contract itself, these two are actually separate. The car does not modify the service plan as well. It doesn't change. Uh, it doesn't um, significantly integrate anything here. So these two are separate. So now, when we look at this, we're going to come back to uh, the 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 transaction price here is one hundred thousand. So the transaction price is one hundred thousand. But when you look at the two standalone selling prices, you can see that if you're going to come and buy the car on this one, you pay one hundred thousand. If you're going to come here for a service three years of span on its own, if you're going to buy a three years of span on its own, you pay twenty five thousand. So do you realize that if you were going to buy this separately, you end up paying one hundred twenty five thousand? But because these are being sold as one product, you're not buying it for 100000 which means there's an element of the discount which is being given here. And the discount is to the equivalent of 25000 Now the next question is, is this 25000 discount specific to any of these products? I don't think so because it has not been stated to be that. Which means, in this case, we need to allocate the 25000 at the discount to both the performance obligations with the motor vehicle in the three years service plan. Now, how do we do that? So, how do we allocate the 100,000 transaction price to the two separate performance obligations? We use it based on standard long selling prices, and as we can see here, we've been keeping the standard long selling price for the motor vehicle and as well as for the, for the service plan, which means in this case, we provide this in-house, so we have the standard long selling prices, so we don't need to estimate anything. So in that case, we're going to use the standard long selling prices to allocate the one hundred dollars from the one hundred thousand transaction price to the two products. So what you then do is you add your one hundred uh, for the most people, you add the twenty-five thousand to get to one hundred twenty-five thousand. So one hundred twenty-five thousand is the total of the standard long selling prices. You now want to allocate for the car, so for the car it becomes 100, the standard loan, over the total, 125, multiplied by the standard loan selling price, which is 100,000, which takes you to 80,000. Then for the service plan, same thing applies, 25,000 or 125,000 multiplied by 100k, which gives you 20,000, which means the revenue for the car becomes 80,000, the revenue for the service becomes 20,000, and you have allocated your transaction price. So basically that is step number four for you, that is what you need to do for allocation of transaction price. For the purposes of revising and for the purposes of practice, I need you to do example number nine, which is in your module. I also need you to do some illustrative examples which are coming from your Saika handbooks, which are illustrative examples from number 33 to number 49. Okay, so if you can do that, I'm sure you can polish up on your skills in terms of allocation of your transaction price. Now let's jump to the last part, which is now you want to recognize your revenue, which is now step number five of this whole process. So step number five is let's now allocate. In the step of this um, pattern, let's now recognize 
So the standard is when you are recognizing your, 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 your revenue, you recognize your revenue when the performance obligation has been satisfied. So what does it mean to satisfy a performance obligation? It means we promised you that we're going to do something. Have we satisfied that promise? Have we done what we have promised? So you only recognize revenue when you have actually done what you promised. So if you promise that you're going to give product a good, if it's a good, then you only satisfy your performance obligation at the point at which the customer controls that good. So an element of control is very important when you're looking at goods. Whilst when it's a service, you see you've satisfied the performance obligation when the customer is actually enjoyed those services that you're providing. So those are the things that you need to look out for when you're looking at step, step five of the, uh, the five step model. Now, the standard then says you need to, allow, uh, to recognize your transaction price either over time or at a point in time. So you actually need to test the product as to whether the revenue is recognized over time or at a point in time. Now, you always test for over time. If it fails to be over time, then it becomes at a point in time, which means you need to go through the stages of trying to prove over time. Then, once it fails, your conclusion becomes otherwise, which is at a point in time. And these are the three conditions which should exist for your revenue to be recognized over time. Now, over time simply means there is no specific date, but it's over a series of the period of time. Now, the conditions are number one, does the customer simultaneously receive uh, or consume the product as the entity performs? So, for example, if I am in class, as I'm lecturing, I am providing the service, and at the same time, you will be consuming that service. So, that means you simultaneously receive as I provide. In that case, that means revenue is recognized over time. And this really happens when you look at examples such as um, provision of internet services. You enjoy the internet service as the service provider provides to you. Same applies with stuff like electricity. When Zesa provides you electricity, that's when you enjoy. So you enjoy over time in that case. But if I'm going to sell you a disk of this video, then it's going to be over time. Because when you look at, if I'm selling the disk to you, I'm actually providing the service right now as I'm, as, I'm, as I'm recording. But as I'm recording, you are not receiving the product. You only receive the product when I actually sell the disk to you. So in that case, that means you're not simultaneously receiving as I'm providing. So test number one then fails in that case. Then when test number one fails, you do not automatically go to point in time. You can do test number two. Test number two is the entity creates or enhances an asset and the customer controls it during the process. So this usually happens when you've got do buildings, for example. So for example, I want to construct a house, but I'm the one who is on the set, and I call a builder to come and build the house for me. So the builder comes and puts a foundation, and puts walls, and puts a roof, and stuff like that. Now, I am in control of the product. This guy is actually creating an asset which I control. In other words, what this guy is doing is this guy is providing a service to me. So I will then recognize the revenue if I'm the builder. I will recognize the, uh, the revenue for building over time because I am creating or enhancing an asset which the customer controls. That's test number two. And test number three is create an asset with no alternative use to the entity. Uh, in the end, it's got enforceable rights to payments uh, for performance up to date. Which means, if I'm going to create an asset which it's only you who can use it, no one else can use it, so that means I can as well recognize my revenue because I'm not going to sell this product to anyone else. So, for example, um, if I'm building Caribe Day, and Caribe Day can only be used by one company, I can then say if that company fails to pay, I'm going to sell Caribe Day to someone else. So I'm creating an asset which only one person can use. In that case, revenue becomes over time, which means that if I build, then I also uh, recognize the revenue. It's the same thing which applies to, let's say you are, you are building a space aircraft. Only NASA can use that if you're in the United States. 
So no one else can actually do that. So in that case, that means you're creating an asset which only the uh, which with no alternative use for someone else, so it, it becomes all the time. Otherwise, if all of those fail, then you have to recognize a revenue at a point in time. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the five-step model. That is what you need to apply. So that is what you're going to be examining on event level one, event level two, obviously this more which we need to talk about, which you can see in the supplementary videos. Yes. Now, lastly, let's talk about contract costs. So for contract costs, I will need you to be aware of two types of contract costs. But sometimes we enter into contracts which then generate revenue. So when you've got contracts, there are certain con costs which are related to those contracts. And there are two types of costs, which is cost of obtaining the contract and cost of fulfilling the contract. Okay. So those, those are the two types of costs that we have. And I need you to be able to uh, account for these costs. So paragraph 91 talks of contracts to obtain, or uh, paragraph 95 to 98 talks about the contracts to fulfill. Yeah. So when you jump to paragraph um, 90, 94, it says your cost to fulfill a contract, if the cost in case of fulfilling a contract with a customer are not within the scope of any other standard, then um, an entity shall recognize an asset for the cost in care to fulfill a contract if one of those costs meet all of the following criteria, that is the cost related directly to a contract or to an anticipated contract that the entity can specifically identify, um, or the cost generated on the end result that the entity will be will use in satisfying, or the cost expected to, uh, to be recovered, and then the cost that relate directly to a contract include the following, direct labor, direct materials, allocation of costs, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so those are the different types of um, con costs to fulfill. Now, in a nutshell, what this is talking about is, you've got two types of costs. In order to obtain a contract, if I pay certain amounts, which are directly related to obtaining that contract, then I am allowed to actually capitalize that contract that cost, and then I spread it over the duration of this contract. Now, it has to be cost which is directly related to obtaining the contract. Now, let's give for example, if I engage in um, and get lawyers to facilitate the contract, so they write the contract or something like that, that's a cost directly related to the contract. So I'm allowed to capitalize it and amortize it often. But if I've got someone who works in a department which is responsible for finding contracts, so I pay this guy his salary, whether he finds the contract or he doesn't find a contract. So in the event that he finds a contract, I cannot take his salary and load it and then amortize it. Because that's not directly related to I was going to pay it anyway. So the costs we're talking about capitalizing here are costs which you would not have in care had this not contract not been found. So the, the, the cost which are allowed to capitalize. Then you put cost of fulfilling. The cost of fulfilling you do not automatically capitalize. Those are the costs which are covered under 95 to 97. So for those types of costs, those are the ones which the standard says you account for them based on the relevant standards which they relate to. For example, you found a construction contract. So for you to be able to do the job, you need to buy equipment that you need to use to construct. That equipment is covered under PPE, so you go to the relevant standard. Then if you are constructing a road, you're going to buy tar, you're going to buy cement. So you take that and then what you do is you, that becomes inventory for you because that is being used in you doing the job. Okay. So you always go to the relevant standard with this okay. So if you're level one, guys, this is the end of after switching. This is, this is what we cover up to now, so I just need you to practice going forward. But if you're in level two, remember this is revision for you. Your elements which are actually supposed to cover at level two are the special considerations on top of the first step model, which we're going to cover on the, uh, the, the video class, which is specific to level two. Okay. I hope you've enjoyed this video class. Okay. Catch you next time. Thank you.